morning. You know, at different times, and I think for different reasons, we've probably felt a little like the squirrel. Oh, he's coming, I promise. There he is. <laughs> Trying to fit into someone else's picture. Feeling uh, maybe a little out of place, a little unsettled about our lives and our identity in the world. And inevitably, we ask ourselves some very important questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And maybe, what are those people laughing at? <laughs> See, we look at all the responsibilities in our lives and the things that we have going on, and we wonder, is this who I am? Uh, am I just someone's mother? Someone's housekeeper, someone's dish cleaner, someone's employee, someone's daughter, someone's son? Is the way I look or the place I live or the jobs that I have, is this who I am? And moreover, why am I here? Am I missing something in life? Am I spending my time wisely the way I was meant to spend my time, the way God wants me to spend my time and made me to do that. This is a map of Antarctica and all of the time zones in Antarctica. There are 11 of them, and some of them seemingly overlap so much that it's hard to tell which zone any one area should be in. I think we can feel divided into so many different directions by either the voices of our culture, by our own voices, and by the responsibilities we have in life, and we hardly know who we really are and why we're really here. We feel like a divided continent that's searching for a purpose that will make us whole, will make us complete, and that will give us a focused and a satisfying answer to these questions. Uh, this warning, we're going to see how God answers these two of our most basic questions in life. Who am I and why am I here when he creates mankind? Another way to say it is, what is our identity and what is our purpose or mission? Last time we were together, we spoke on and started a series on the mission of God. And we looked then at how that mission of God is uniquely related to who God is, to his unique identity, to his character, a character that is benevolent and that couldn't help but create a world so that it could know the joy that he has in himself, the meaning and significance in life that he has to offer anything he would create, a character that wants all people to experience the fullness of life, which is God himself. This week, we're going to see how that mission of God is not only part of God's nature and character, but it's a unique part of who we are and what makes us human. And so this week, we're going to look at the mission of God in humanity. The mission of God in humanity. Turn with me, if you can, to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Then God said... Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. In this text, we're going to discover that we're created for God's mission. We are created for God's mission. And we see this primarily and ultimately in the unique image of God that we were created in, in the image of God. But what is this image? What does that even mean, the image of God? 
And you may have noticed that in the passage, God doesn't give us a checklist. He doesn't give us a long thing of character qualities, of what that specifically means. He just says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And so he made mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them. We don't have a specific long list of things, and maybe what God's trying to get across is that it's not just one or two things that we can pinpoint. Essentially, the image and likeness of God in us may simply be anything that distinguishes us from the rest of creation and that uniquely ties us to God himself. Essentially, the image of God is, is a range of characteristics. It's, it's our capacity to think, to imagine, to dream. It's our ability to create and to be creative. It's our ability to speak and have meaningful conversation. Our ability to relate to other people and have meaningful relationships. It's our desire for morality. It's our desire for truth. It's what makes us spiritual, you could say. And the fact that we are spiritual people, not just plant matter or something else. But, amidst all of those multiple things that the image of God most likely is, there's one specific thing we want to point out. One thing that God actually does draw our attention to in Genesis 1 that uniquely identifies us as being part of God's mission. We see that here. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth. Later on, he says, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. You see, the image of God in us is not simply a quality, but it's tied to our purpose, to our activity, to our mission. We are, put simply, to rule the earth as God's representatives, as God's image bearers. Gordon Wenham, in a commentary, uh, word biblical commentary on Genesis, he actually says this, and I think he, he has a good comment here. And I don't think you can see that. I was playing around with that, but that's the best I could do. So just trust me that he's really saying this. He says this, The image makes man God's representatives on earth. That man is made in the divine image and is thus God's representative was a common oriental view of the king. Both Egyptian and Assyrian texts describe the king as the image of God. Furthermore, man is here bidden to rule and subdue the rest of creation, an obviously royal task. And Psalm 8 speaks of man as having been created as a little lower than the angels, yet crowned with glory and made to rule the works of God's hands. The allusions to the functions of royalty are quite clear, both here and in Psalm 8. Another consideration suggesting that man is a divine representative on earth arises from the very idea of an image. Images of gods or kings were viewed as representatives of the deity or of the king. The divine spirit was often thought of as indwelling an idol or an image, thereby creating a close unity between the god and his image. Now, Egyptian writers often spoke of kings as being in God's image. They never really referred to other people in this way. And it appears that the Old Testament has democratized this old idea. It affirms that not just a king, but every man and every woman bears God's image and is his representative on earth. In other words, we are made to represent God and to fill the earth with his glory. We are his image stamped throughout the earth, and our purpose is to reflect to all creation the beauty and the wonder and the magnificence of the creator God as we ourselves enjoy the fullness of life 
in Him. We are a little bit like an instrument. An instrument made to play a beautiful song. A beautiful song the instrument didn't write. A beautiful song that has no glory to give to the instrument, but which ascribes all glory to the song writer, to the one in whom the song came from. We are like instruments playing beautiful music that God wrote for us to play and to enjoy. We are God's image bearers. So, you may be wondering, why is this satisfying? I mean, this doesn't sound a whole lot like it's exciting for me. It doesn't sound a whole lot like it's about me. I mean, come on, you're telling me the meaning of life is to be an image bearer for God. Well, this, in fact, is the most satisfying answer to our most basic questions of who I am and of why I am here. Because God is the ultimate purpose and he is the ultimate need of every single one of us. We saw this last week in Genesis, or last time in Genesis 2, verse 7, which says this, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. You see, God is the source of our life as he breathes his own life into us. He's connected us to himself in such a way that he is the ultimate source of everything that we need of the fullness of life that we need. But we also see this in Genesis 2 at the end of the creation week. In Genesis 2, verses 1 to 2, it says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Note that while we are the pinnacle of God's creative work, we are not the pinnacle of his creative week. The week reaches its climax in our creation, but it reaches its purpose and its goal and its end in the last day, a holy day set aside to show all of us that the purpose of life is not in ourselves, but it's in God. God is not selfish in creating us. God is not about just making it a slavish worship of himself. God creates you, and he knows that the best life you can have the best purpose and the highest life you could ever wish to be a part of has to involve God. And so he tells us on the seventh day, make it holy, rest from your work, and remember the purpose of your life. It's not found in your work. It's not found in this creation. It's not found in the gifts and the blessings that I've given you in this creation for you to enjoy but it's found in a relationship with me, in a rest you can only have in me. It may be in our blood to be German, to be Hispanic, to be Asian or African or European or Italian as I am, or at least half of me is the, the gut up. <laughs> It may be in our blood to be an American, to be part of our family, maybe in our blood to be a great number of things, a great number of good things, but it's in our soul to be in God. It's in our soul to need Him, to have life in Him. God knew that your greatest chance at the greatest life possible would have to be in Him. And He creates you 
just so you could know that kind of a life. That's the kind of God that you have. But the very fact that we need to be reminded of this this morning is evidence of a problem. As we saw last time, something happened to this paradise that God created. We now live in a world that's plagued with the divisions of sin. Divisions of sin. And we all know in our lives that sin is the great divider. Before we move on to this next section, I have to give a plug to one of my professors at Dallas Theological Seminary. This next section we're going to talk about uh, comes largely from his notes. And uh, I put a lot of information up here. I'm not going to go over it all right now, but if you look at this later, and for those of you who might be online watching this, uh, he has on iTunes U a full class available for free. You don't have to take tests or papers or anything. That's, I'm, I'm not happy about that, okay? <laughs> And it's not the entire class, but it's like a section of each session. It's, it's insane. If you search his name on uh, YouTube, you can find many different uh, chapel sermons and other things he's done as well. But I'm greatly indebted to him for this next uh, section. And what we're going to see is that there's five divisions of the fall. There's five things in our lives and in the world that were divided and separated and would never be the same because of sin. Five things that separate us from fulfilling our mission and our need as God's image bearers. The first we're going to look at is man from God. Man from God. This, by the way, is, if you can't see very well, this is represented by God, the Trinity up here, and a little arrow between with a cross through it. Section through it. If you look at Genesis 3, verses 9 to 10, it says this, But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And in Genesis 3, 23 to 24, it says this, So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life, which I think is a literal tree, but I think is also a symbol of God who is the real source of our life. You see, mankind is hiding from God. God has to ask, where are you? And as we saw last time, he's actually extending an invitation, an invitation that we hide from. Adam and Eve are ashamed and they're alienated from God. They also experience a spiritual separation. Humanity's relationship with the Creator, the source of their life, is broken off. Humanity is separated from God. And isn't that the world that we live in today? A world where we might not even remember God in any particular day. A, day where, a time where we feel like there's something missing in our lives. Where most people, many people in this world anyway, don't want to admit that that missing life that they need is in God. We also see a separation of man from himself. And this we see represented by a spiral inward and a broken inside, you could say. Genesis 3, 7 and 9 to 10 says this, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Man is separated from himself and feels now guilt, feels shame in his soul, something he was never meant to feel and to know. Shame over sin. Shame over the disappointment of losing and destroying that relationship with God. But humanity's need for love and significance 
now without a relationship with God, leaves everything in life uncertain and makes life empty for us. This is why we have depression. This is why we feel emptiness in life. This is why we, we don't have our satisfactions met. It's because we're separated from God and we're divided within ourselves. We also see in Genesis 3.19, God says, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam and Eve would die. And death is actually a separation or a division of our body from our soul. It's a, it's a ripping apart of two things that were never meant to be ripped apart. Death is a returning to where we started and not a continuing into further life with God. We're separated, we're divided within ourselves. We also see that man is separated or divided from others. And this we see, of course, with these lines on the sides here, both with family and with everyone else. Genesis 3, 11 to uh, 13 and 16 says this, And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate Verse 16 says, To the woman, he said, God said, Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. What we see in the garden here is immediate accusations, an immediate cover-up of the sin and shame that I have and a placing of it on other people. Adam to Eve, Eve to Satan. Husbands, you ever blamed your wife for something? Or in the midst of your sin being exposed, have you brought up something else about her? Wives, have you done the same? Christian, have you ever blamed God for your sin or blamed Satan for your sin? It wasn't me, it was Satan. I couldn't help myself. We show ourselves to be just like our parents. We also see that there's a breakdown of marital and familial relationships. Adam and Eve, when they covered themselves with fig leaves, they covered themselves not only from God, but from each other. They distanced themselves from each other. They used to be naked and unashamed, unabashed, had a relationship that had no separation. And now they're covering themselves from each other. We also see the first two children Cain and Abel. Cain committed murder. The first son of a new humanity murders. Divides his relationship with his closest friend, his brother. And while we may have not killed one of our brothers, I'm sure... We've thought about it. <laughs> or sisters. We're just like our parents. And in our family relationships, that last verse said that, Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. This is a unique, weird translation, but basically what it's trying to get across to us, it's not saying that women will be just so, you know, they're just can't get enough of guys. Your desire will be for your husband. You'll just let him be your, your whole life. Like, that's not what it's talking about. What this is talking about, this is the same phrase to use of Cain later on when it says, when God says to Cain, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. This is a negative thing. This desire for you is a woman's desire to usurp 
her husband's decisions, her husband's authority, her husband's respect. And it's the man's selfish desire to try and usurp authority over women, to try and say that his way is the highway and the only way, to say that he is better than a woman. And don't we see this everywhere? Mankind that was originally created in God's image, both male and female, will now fight each other for who's better. We also see a separation of man from nature. Man from nature. We see this with man standing over nature and arrows crossed out there on the bottom. Genesis 3, 17 to 19 says this, God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam is now forced to work the ground through painful toil. It would, it would become harmful for Adam. Thorns and thistles weren't part of God's original creation, but now creation attacks mankind. And instead of ruling over the earth and spreading God's image through it, establishing peace and harmony in the world, now mankind would die and go back into the ground, would become buried in the ground, would become ruled by the earth he was created out of. Genesis 3, 21 to 23 says this as well. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. You see, mankind is now banished from the paradise of the creation and would struggle for survival. What evolutionists are so quick to point out in our world, a world that's chaos, a world that seems to be survival of the fittest, was not part of God's original creation. This world was meant to be a paradise. We were never supposed to have to fly to Hawaii to try and find some of that paradise. This world was never supposed to be a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Well, that's what it's become. This is even more obvious when we see that... Oh, let me say this first. Uh, yeah, nature actually paid the price. It paid the price for mankind's sin. As soon as Adam and Eve had garments of skin made for them. An animal was slaughtered as a substitute to clothe mankind. And this would become an example and an image of the sacrificial system in Israel where mankind uses animals to be their substitute. Man and animals are now separate from each other, divided. The last one we want to look at is nature from nature. This is what I was going to talk about. Nature from nature. We see that with nature itself on the bottom here, separated from itself. Genesis 3, 17 to 18 says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. It will produce thorns and thistles. Romans 8, 20 to 22 says, Creation was subjected to frustration. It was in bondage to decay. And the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Nature was meant to be a paradise, but it became a broken and destructive and violent, decaying world. This becomes even more obvious when we look at a passage like Isaiah 11, a passage that paints for us a picture of the world God meant for us to live in, the world he will restore, and it's a picture that makes us seem a little funny. It seems just a little strange, a little silly even, because we don't know this kind of a world. 
This is what it says. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear and the young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play over the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither hurt nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, mankind was supposed to live in this kind of a nature. A nature without death and decay and suffering. A nature without so many of the things we see as normal. And a nature that because God's glory is known can have this kind of peace. A nature that needs image bearers to spread the knowledge of God throughout the earth, to spread the peace of God throughout the earth, to cover the earth with God's glory as the waters cover the sea can see this kind of a world. That's God's purpose. It's the end of his purpose and mission. At its very core, our sin is a rebellion against God's mission for us. It is a turning inward when we were meant to be outward. God makes us missional, divine image bearers, but we make ourselves prideful, individual image bearers. He made us to rely on him, but all we want to do is rely on ourselves. But sin did not destroy God's plan. God created a world knowing that mankind would separate, would turn inward. His plan was not weakened by sin. In fact, his plan was to show us the full extent of his love and glory in overcoming our sin. He introduces a sixth separation, the cross. A separation which would endure all five divisions of sin and would overcome each one through the redemption of Christ. The redemption of Christ. We see, first of all, that Christ was separated from God the Father. The Son was separated in fellowship from the Father because of our sin. The Father put all of his wrath and all of his fury and all the judgment we deserved for all of our sin on the Son. And Jesus, for a moment in time, felt the anguish of what it's like to be broken in fellowship from God. Yet, the veil tore from top to bottom. Jesus, by experiencing the greatest separation from God we can imagine, makes possible the connection and the life of all mankind back to God. In Genesis 3, verse 24, it says that there was a cherubim at the east end of the garden blocking the way with a flaming sword, blocking the way to the tree of life, which is blocking the way to paradise and to God. The temple was a representation of that garden. Its entrance was at the east, and on that curtain was a cherubim standing in the way of anyone coming to God's presence. Jesus dies on the cross and the veil is torn. You can have life with God again because of the redemption of Christ. We also see that Christ was separated from himself. Jesus Christ, the creator and source of life, died. He died in suffering and agony, a gruesome death, and his spirit was divided from his body. Jesus died as our substitute, taking all the guilt and all the shame of our sin upon himself. He once for all nailed it to the cross, a symbol that he has overcome the origin of our guilt, the origin of our sin. And every sin since that tree to the tree that Christ died on nails it to the cross. His separation from himself enables us to be whole again, 
to be free from guilt and shame, and to have forgiveness. Christ was also separated from others. Everyone turned away from Jesus. His own brothers, his disciples, his people to whom he came to save as Messiah. Jesus was alone, and he was isolated at the cross. John 1 says it like this, He was in the world, or first John 1, sir, And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet Jesus' death makes salvation for all people possible. Jesus' abandonment from all mankind unites all mankind under God. Jesus experiencing the greatest division from others enables the greatest reunion of all mankind into a relationship with the Father. We continue in John 1. It says this in verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, God's children, God's family, a unity that we've never known, a unity that we've always been meant to have. We also see that Christ was separated from nature, he was crowned with thorns and given bitter wine to drink. He was nailed to wood from a cross, the very source of man's division from nature. And he was buried in a tomb of rock, laid behind a stone like we sang this morning. Yet Jesus' resurrection speaks hope for us. It speaks hope for the world to be made new the way Christ's body was made new. And the suffering and the chaos of the earth can be overcome. We can live in a peaceful world, but only through Christ. And finally, we see a separation of nature from nature at the cross. At his death, the sky darkened like night from 12 to 3, midday. There was an earthquake. Rocks were split open. Tombs opened and people against nature rose from the dead during this time. Yet all of creation is waiting, including you, for a time when Jesus will return to resurrect those who believe and restore paradise to the earth. At the cross, God guaranteed and provided the solution to each of the five divisions of the fall. And in the sixth division, the Father of the Father from the Son, there's a real cosmic act that changes the whole flow of eternal human and divine history. Reconciliation with God is made possible. So what we've seen this morning is that we are all created for God's mission. We are unique image bearers. And that's the most satisfying answer to our question because God is the ultimate purpose and he's the ultimate need of every one of us. And though this world has been divided by sin, God's mission is not divided. And he more than overcomes our sin with a great glory in the cross that we would never know without so that God's redemption was always his plan. God's plan was always redemption. The cross was not a backup. It was the plan to show the world God's amazing love and to enable all of us to know and to show God's glory. Everywhere we go, God has us on his redemptive mission as his image bearers to show the world, the greatness of his love through the gospel. The greatness of the image restored back to us that we can all have once again. So there's one very simple application of this this morning. There's one very simple thing that we as image bearers can do and must do both for ourselves and for others. 
And that is to redeem what was lost. To redeem what was lost. If you're an unbeliever this morning, you are lost. You must know that Jesus Christ came to restore the image of God in you, to give fullness of life to you. He's reaching out to you. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to be deeply satisfied in Him. He wants you to have your sin removed and to be made whole again, to know the answer to those questions of who am I and why am I here? If you're a Christian, I have a very specific challenge for you this morning. This week, represent God's image with one neighbor. Invite one neighbor to your home for dinner this week. One neighbor. Don't invite them to church. That's a little too easy. Invite them into your home. Make dinner for them. Show them what it means to be an image bearer and start a relationship where they can see the love, the joy, the peace and significance you have in a relationship with Christ. And I know many of you already do this. And so invite a new neighbor, someone else, someone who maybe is on your block or within your range of influence that you've never talked to. And if you have, it's just been yelling because the music's too loud. One neighbor. Is there any greater joy that we could have this week than seeing someone have God's image renewed again in them and come to the Father through the Son, praising Him for the new life that they've been given? Life out of death. Divisions made whole. Answers. The most satisfying answers to who I am and to why I'm here. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you that you have sent your Son You've sent him not to condemn us. You've sent him not to show us the, the wrongs in our life and to con just revel in our failure, but you've sent him to experience every single one of our failures and to overcome everyone through the cross, to give us the promise of new life, to give us our greatest purpose and mission in life, a purpose that can give us our greatest joy and greatest significance in you. Lord, if there's anyone this morning that needs to accept your son for the first time, I pray that they would pray this same prayer with me and that Christians alike would renew this prayer in their heart that Jesus, you are my Savior. You have saved me from all of my sin. In you I have life and nothing else. I trust in your cross in your sacrifice to give me forgiveness and to restore my relationship with you once again. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. And it's in your name that we will pray forever. Amen. Would you stand with me as we leave with one final song this morning? And would you be a people this week who take great pride in the image that you bear and go out into a world that desperately, desperately needs it? Thank you.